this in the start at the start of the book you have a really interesting section that i want to explore a little bit because you have mm -hmm. you, you divide memory into a couple of different categories and in part i kind of want you if you could just briefly take us through these different categories of memory and kind of explain what they are mm -hmm. Yeah, then uh, uh, these, uh, these categories are categories that uh, especially sociologists, they have uh, explored these categories. Then I start with collective memory that is uh, referenced by many historians, but one of the, the, the authors who work it on this um, uh, on this concept is Maurice uh, Halbach, who is uh, a French sociologist uh, indeed. And of course, uh, many of these authors, when they, they are working on these concepts, um, they were not referring to, to slavery, but they created uh, then I would say uh, frameworks that help us to understand. Then I start with collective memory of slavery by emphasizing that is a modality of memory that is a kind of discourse uh, as that happens in the present and relates with uh, the past. But in the, the, in the case of collective memory, we need uh, what we call transmission then we need the uh, living groups. In all cases, memory need uh, living groups, people who, who, who are still uh, among us. And in the case of collective memory, transmission is important. Then we have groups who transmitted through generations uh, a memory that is not uh, the addition of the, the memories of each individual, but it is how the group represents uh, the past to itself and to others. Now, in the case of collective memory, I, uh, my point is that uh, collective memory, of course, is transmitted and is plural. Uh, is plural and as Halbach put, uh, put in his work, is, uh, it, it operates also through frameworks. And um, these frameworks in the case of slavery, memory of slavery, include the family, include religion, of course, include um, then um, social class and so on. And in that particular chapter, then I look at uh, the fact that we have a collective memory of slavery, but it is plural. It's not the same for those who are uh, descendants of those who uh, were enslaved. Uh, this memory is different from the memory of those uh, who were slave owners or slave traders. Then this is what I, I, I bring a number of examples, examples that I, uh, for example, the case of Francisco Felix de Souza, who is um, um, then a slave merchant in Republic of Benin. This is a case that I worked in the past, not through that lens, but I explore that case and confront him uh, with another uh, slave. In, in his case, he was a slave trader, but I, com I compare him uh, to Thomas Jefferson, who was uh, a slave owner, and then his uh, white family and his black family that was then the family of uh, enslaved people. And of course, that in this particular cases, uh, these are families that have uh, some kind of um, their their stories are are documented. Uh, then the, we can still have uh, access to them. But this is pretty much to to create this sort of grid that would allow other than people reading the book to go to 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 study other cases and understand how collective memory operates. Then I move in the second uh, chapter to to cultural memory which uh, is a kind of memory that is ritualized and often uh, associated with uh, material heritage. Uh, then uh, memorials, for example, and monuments, they are associated, of course, uh, to the idea of uh, cultural memory. And uh, then I show also, the, of course, how these different modalities, sometimes they are uh, intertwined. Uh, I think that it allows us by using these categories to, to understand how complex uh, these um, relations we have as groups and individuals uh, with uh, the past. In that particular chapter, then I look at the, is, is, to a particular kind of uh, memorial, 
uh, that is ritualized, that are these uh, walls of names, and also establish uh, relations then uh, with uh, the Holocaust, which is something that we can talk about uh, because much of these studies about memory uh, that we have uh, to this day are uh, referred to, to the Holocaust and not to slavery. Then I moved in the third chapter to public memory of slavery. And this is a modality of memory that is politicized, again, carried by groups uh, who uh, occupy uh, the public sphere and also the public space. And public space, I talk here about uh, the physical space of uh, squares um, and then uh, streets and so on, buildings. And uh, I explored then how this public memory is always politicized and that these groups, they are constantly fighting to uh, make their uh, views of the past prevail in the public space. Very often, uh, these uh, views, they materialize through, through monuments which is uh, a form, then I, it's a much more crystallized form uh, of memory. Then I insist that monuments are not about the history. Uh, they are politicized, they are carried, they are constructed by groups who organize themselves to, to have these uh, devices in, in view. And then I move uh, after that, then I have a chapter on um, official memory which is the result of all this, uh, this melting pot uh, between groups and, um, and uh, with different views. But at some point, uh, these memories, they become official when either an institution that can be, I don't know, UNESCO, or can be the government, or can then either the federal government or the state government, uh, then any of these institutions, when they embrace one, um, then version of these memories, then memory becomes official. And here I explore especially how slavery entered then the, the museum. And I'm not looking at community museums or museums that represent uh, groups that are more or less, uh, that are not well organized, but I look at museums that are uh, more state museums than uh, in the case, the National Museum of African American History and Culture here in Washington, D.C., uh, Museum of Aquitaine uh, in uh, Bordeaux in France, uh, also the, um, the Nantes uh, History Museum uh, also uh, in France, and then the International Slavery Museum in, um, in the Liverpool in uh, the U.K., then this is the moment when memory becomes official. Then finally, I have uh, two other chapters that are not in these modalities of memory, but uh, they are needed because we mixed up a lot. There is a lot of um, uh, dialogues, you can say, between memory and public history. Public history being a particular field that comes from a, a discipline that deals with people who are professionals. But these professionals, they are always influenced by, um, by these discourses about memory and about the mem uh, by the memory of their groups, their societies, and so on. Then that chapter focuses on that. And finally, I conclude with a chapter that is pretty much um, open which is the chapter on art and memory by making the case that art perhaps is one of these modalities of memory that uh, engages with uh, a lot of complex elements that are much less uh, binary than uh, the other ones. Then I don't know if I was, if it was too long or uh, if it was satisfactory, but overall that you don't even need to read the book, just to take this and you can go from there. Well, I would say still you should buy it because there's so many great stories that you have in there that um, we'll, we'll only be able to explore some of them in a little bit more in detail. Um, but it, it, that in part, I think that was, the way you organize these different memories was one of the fascinating parts because it's like, um, as a Civil War historian, I'm usually used to like, we're talking memory, but we never break into pieces of like, what type of memory are we actually talking about of the, these kind of public collective. Um, and that was nice to see kind of the, the differentiation that we may need to embrace more mm -hmm. within Civil War history too. Mm 